iPhone 12 MagSafe, two big problems it just revealed. Mm. I don't think they're that big, these problems, but you know how it goes with a new release and a new launch. Everybody's looking into it. It's uh, especially with Apple, especially with the iPhone. You know, people, they want to check it out. They want to test the durability. They want to see what's really happening. Mm. They want to see what's really real. Right. Including us, actually, a uh, quick shout out, latest Unbox Therapy video. Back to the roots. Go check it out. iPhone 12 Ben test. Surprising results. Mm. Go check it out on Unbox Therapy. Uh, you can come back and watch this. Don't worry about this. You go watch that, then come back and watch this. Anyway, MagSafe problems. Of course, I haven't seen this yet myself. In other words, I haven't experienced this, but uh, apparently with the official Apple cases... The MagSafe is damaging the case. Somehow, the combination, uh, the abrasiveness of the MagSafe and the magnetic connection and the way that it sort of spins around whatever the case material on the official Apple cases happens to be. So you, you can scroll down a little bit on this, uh, on this post here and you'll get to a picture of a blue case with a ring around the Apple logo. Now, the thing here is, it's kind of subtle at the moment. There's a, a wear point around the Apple logo. You can see it's sort of turned white a little bit. These cases, I mean, they're not the best to begin with. They kind of get dirty and little fragments and things on them. And the material that they use, it has a, a kind of a grittiness to it, mm -hmm. a, a grippiness, a grittiness. And so you can imagine that, yeah, you would get, you could get some wear with the magnetic charger slapping on and off of there. And if uh, this is what we're looking at right now on the silicone case, then what about I don't know. I, I, I assume you expect to use it for four or five months, something like that, at least. Hmm. And maybe it's going to end up looking worse. Now, this, to me, I mean, they say it's a huge problem. I don't know. If it's a, I don't think it's a huge problem. But yeah. you know how people are with the Apple devices, Will? They like the elegance. Mm -hmm. They want to look a certain way for the most part. So I can see people just wanting to be aware of this, possibly select a different case product or possibly select a different charge method. Yes. If uh, if uh, if they're really not liking the, this particular look, now the other one is something I'm surprised by, but it comes back to your uh, favorite subject, which is the the wallet. Mm. You love the wallet. Um, well, you love talking about the wallet. You hate yeah, the wallet. I, I, yeah. Will hates the wallet, but he loves talking about the wallet. You see the difference over there. Well, I just want to see it in uh, action. No, like, I saw it in action. Know. The dude tweeted. He tagged oh. you. Did you see it? I didn't see it. No. The guy tweeted. He tagged you. He tagged myself. And he's okay. pulling it out of his pocket. He has, I don't know, pr like fairly tight jeans. Okay. And the wallet's flying all over the place. Oh, really? Yeah, it's flying. Uh-oh. So you're... Uh, Who's this guy? I mean, he's a guy. He's a guy? I don't remember. I don't remember his... Uh, the shout out to the guy on Twitter. I don't remember the okay. handle. I'll look for it. But people have done the test in and out the pocket. I haven't received the wallet yet, so I can't do the test in and out the pocket, which I would do otherwise. Yeah. But it's it's uh, flopping off. However, here's the crazy one, which is uh, talked about in this particular article, which is people leaving the wallet on and then slapping the charger on top of the wallet. Mm. Can but, you do that? Well, no, you can't do that. You can't be having these cards in the way, obviously. Oh, okay. And, but people, I don't know if it was articulated fully, but you have to assume if some people with a little bit less knowledge about magnets, yeah. cards, and electrical current might just say, I'm just slap it right there. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you can't, you don't want to be doing that because those cards uh, have RFID chips and magnetic strips. Oh, and okay. when you start sending current, you start, you start, it's a nasty setup. So you could damage, uh, multiple components so that's that's maybe a more serious one if anybody's thinking that they can do that you can't do that you gotta take the wallet off slap the charger on i thought apple showcased it fine i thought people would know this uh -huh. apparently that's not the case i mean there's enough of them out there someone's gonna attempt it so anyway a couple of things to consider we also got some uh charge speed stuff come through on the on the on the magsafe charger turns out it's about half the speed of the wired connection mm -hmm. with the 20 watt charger so Keep that in mind as well. I know they're saying it's up to 15 watts, but in actual practice, you're talking about half the speed, roughly, if you think the convenience is worth it. You take that into consideration. Now, speaking of durability, it extends beyond just the case and the MagSafe. We have uh, seen a number of drop tests come through, which I'm going to get to as the uh, in the next story here. 
But this one actually caught my attention because it it actually isn't, a, isn't any kind of story that's been written. Instead, it's just a tweet from Ben Geskin. And what you're looking at here is what uh, what looks like a retail unit of an iPhone 12 in the store. It looks like it's in the Apple store. Now, I mean, we have to obviously uh, read into it because uh, we don't have a ton of context here. But what what, what you're basically seeing is, is what looks like the, the graphite version of the iPhone 12 Pro mm. is what I would guess because that looks like the, the shimmer that the frame has looks like the stainless steel. And it's all, it looks like it's all chipped up, like it's losing the coloring on top of the stainless steel, mm -hmm. which I guess this kind of exposes their, their process a little bit for how they get those colors onto the stainless steel frame. Now, obviously in a retail environment, the thing's going to get handled and knocked around way more than in your life and in your pocket. However, it's still interesting to look at, to, to recognize that maybe that stainless steel product is not the most durable ever. And maybe, I'm going to go a step further, maybe you actually select for the non-colored version of the surgical grade stainless steel, mm -hmm. which you would pick up on the silver model mm -hmm. of the Pro. Yeah, the silver model of the Pro, which is like the white back. Mm -hmm. That, I believe, is going to have no coating. I think that's just straight up stainless steel. And therefore, if it doesn't have any coloring, there's nothing to chip. Now, you could get scratches and nicks. We all remember this from the old iPod days when he had a stainless steel back. Yeah. Stainless steel, you get lots of scratches on it. However, it kind of has a nice nice enough finish that you live through it. All of this is uh, less, less of a case if you use a case. However, it's worth noting. Yeah, and so the silver model, I believe, is just straight up surgical stainless steel. So if you're, if you're very against the idea of having any chips on there and you're not going to be using a case, you may want to think about it or you may want to assume that the retail model in that picture is just getting beat up a lot more than yours will. Mm. It's worth thinking about. Now we come to the drop tests and actually I was, you know, you have the usual suspects doing the drop tests trying to figure out the durability on this device and uh, there, there's one that stood out to me here which is not a usual su suspect as far as I know. Granted, I'm not watching all that many drop tests, but you have an insurance company. Here's Allstate, big-time insurance company, actually doing their very own drop test, Will, because they're trying to get into the business of insuring these devices for you. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Well, they're if you can uh, finance the iPhone, you can insure it. Right? And they're so expensive, these things now. I guess it's people are thinking about it. So anyways, this is just one of many, but the reason I selected it is because... Allstate went out of their way to say it's better than any other smartphone from a durability perspective. Any other smartphone, but I don't even feel like Allstate's been testing every single smartphone. Hmm. But what do I know? Uh, anyway, the, the conclusion of all of these drop tests is basically that the ceramic shield helps a little bit with drops. However, it's no magic, it's no magic wand. All right, you're still going to be in trouble here if you drop the thing. And if you scroll forward in this particular video, you're going to see some shattered foam. But the front side appears to be a little bit more resistant than the, uh, the back side. And funny enough, I actually noticed on Twitter, Max Weinbach, he cracked his iPhone 12 Pro like the day he got it just by placing it on the table and the camera module touching the table. Oh. So... He, he got a replacement for it, by the way. You had to scroll through to find the tweet, but it kind of shocked me. He said, I did not drop this thing, and I got this crack. That, so, that's, not, that's not the one. That's his old old model. Keep going. A little bit more. He tweets a lot, obviously. There, there you go. You got it. That's the replacement. That's the replacement model. So Apple already replaced. Of course, it's Apple. You know what they're going to do. There's the crack. Look at that. So it shattered through the glass, right through the LiDAR sensor, right where the camera unit uh, lives. So again, glass, glass is glass, no, no ceramic shield on the back. And he claims it was very subtle what caused the crack. It looks like a substantial crack. So there's so many iPhones out there. How much can you information can you derive from build, when you're considering build quality from one person's experience, there's obviously many other iPhones that have not cracked, but it's so close to the launch date, so close to him getting his hands on it that it kind of 
I don't know, it makes you a little bit afraid about it. So maybe you want to consider either you put the case on or you're just gentle with it. I mean, it's a nice piece of machinery, so you just take it easy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, at least Apple is easy enough to deal with. They have the retail footprint, at least in North America, so you don't have to really be without your phone because that's a huge problem, Will. It's your phone. Mm -hmm. If it's your only phone, you type person, you only got one phone. It's a lot of people. And you got to get it replaced. You don't want to be sending it away somewhere. No. And Apple's one of these few ones where you can actually go to a physical store and swap it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a nice little advantage. But anyway, Allstate goes out of their way. They drop it a bunch of different times. Sure, it shatters. They say it's a little bit better than previous models and better than other models that they tested, which include uh, the iPhone 11, Samsung Galaxy S20, and I guess a couple of others. But they definitely didn't test every phone. However, I guess they're just saying of the po some popular models, this is the one that you want. Uh, please don't drop your phone, no matter which phone it is. Hmm. That's my recommendation because I feel any phone is capable of cracking once you drop it. But if you want more insight into that, you can watch the variety of drop tests that are out there. And you can also watch our Ben test, as I recommended earlier. Hmm. Go check that out. You might be surprised. YouTube is rolling out a redesign to the player page, and I think it's long overdue. Yes, I agree. Because uh, there's certain things about it that bug me, the current player. Hmm. Uh, small things, but things. Okay. Nonetheless. Uh, particularly around maximizing the, the player, the window, hmm. as opposed to just having some kind of a gesture, which is what they added, by the way. Mm -hmm. A gesture or just to turn to turn the display. And they just had to, you had to hit the little tiny square button in the mm -hmm. corner to go full screen. And it's just, is that really the best way? They also worked on captions a little bit, took it out of the prime time location and, uh, and moved it up to the top right corner is the before after on that. And uh, same for autoplay. They put it in a more prominent location from where it was previously. But my favorite of the new features is uh, how they're going to deal with full screen mode in the redesign. Because this is a thing you do a thousand times, you know, on a typical smartphone. Yeah. Actually, YouTube has been the thing that I miss most about the Galaxy Z Fold 2. Actually, I have it right here. I just looked at it and realized, and, and it still has battery right now. Hmm. YouTube on my Pixel feels so trash <laughs> compared to that huge display. Whoa. And never, uh, because it's so big when it's unfolded, you have very few missed presses clicks or missed gestures or missed inputs around the rotation of the device mm. it's a great youtube i mean obviously i don't what do i have to man i don't have to tell you 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 probably already got it because look at i mean look at the display will it's a giant you would want to watch youtube on there wouldn't you mm. so much space to do things so maybe i gotta go back i don't know well no i gotta use the iphone now it's too many phones but anyway, I'll just say, when it comes to the traditional smartphone uh, form factor, we need to do, we need something better on the flipping around and on the gestures. And so the, okay. the, the new implementation on the new YouTube for both Android and iOS, to enter YouTube's full screen mode, all you got to do is swipe up on the player and an opposite downward action lets you exit. Makes sense. I mean, that's so smooth. Uh -huh. Just bang, bang. Throw it up, throw it down. Throw okay, it up, it throw again. it down. Okay. It's, yeah, man, it's I can't great. wait to try that out. Thank God, something like that. And another way to enter this mode is through a rotate, which will be a suggested action that YouTube also introduced today. It seems like a no-brainer. It seems so obvious. Mm -hmm. And the, the little rotate icon is there so you know it's activated because you know sometimes, Will, you're laying down or something and you don't want it to. You just quickly toggle it off. Right. It's lovely stuff. And there's another suggestion that can prompt users to enter the VR player. And there's more suggestions coming into in the future where it will kind of within the player make a suggestion for what you should or shouldn't be doing. So iOS and Android, exciting times. Oh, the other thing, it's going to boost the video chapters experience. So uh, it's going to let you click the various chapters within the within the player to get a list view of the chapters and right. not just along the playhead. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that people were actually tweeting me about is you can no longer tap the playhead 
to different points. Oh, you have you to have drag to it. Hold it? You have to drag it. Oh. That's, okay. an, that's something that people were hitting me up with, which I don't know how big of a deal that is because you still have to double tap for 30 seconds or whatever it is, you know, the double tap. And then because they were saying people accidentally were tapping along the playhead mm. and kind of spoiling it for themselves. Right. Things like this. So we'll see uh, how this all works out. I can't wait to try out the new player. Uh, PUBG. PUBG is making news because they had a few words to say about the next generation game consoles. They had a little bit to say about the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, and the Xbox Series S. And the reason that we're seeing some headlines here is because PUBG said, hey, uh, apologies to the Series S buyers, but uh, you're going to be dealing with 30 FPS instead of 60 FPS. Mm. Now, I need to say for now. Yeah. I need to say that. Okay. Because it may change in the future. Apparently, they're trying to work on it, but it's not the best news right now. Mm -hmm. You're Microsoft you're out here. You're trying to market things. During launch. You're trying to say, oh, look, it's just just not 4K. Mm. And maybe you don't have a 4K display. Okay, fine. Series S. I'm going to save some bucks. Mm -hmm. You see a piece of news like this, and you say to yourself, okay, I could deal with the resolution, but if I'm constantly dealing with a subpar frame rate, 30 frames... Because all these displays, they all at least support 60 frames. Mm -hmm. So 30 frames, now you might be questioning your decision. You might be saying, I'm going to spend a little extra because I don't want this to become commonplace. Now, it may be right. exclusive to PUBG for now, or and it may be temporary also. Uh, officially, let's see what they say. PUBG is playable on PS5 and Xbox Series X when the consoles launch in November via backwards compatibility. So they can just port over the current versions for the PS4 Pro and the current Xbox One X. Hmm. And you see those support the higher frame rates. They can just port that over. As opposed to the Series S, which will get the port from the Xbox One S. Mm. Now, it's tough to keep it all together, but I believe I said that correctly right there. Uh, so, the Series X uses the Xbox One X game build. That's the 60 FPS frame rate. And then here's the quote. From who makes PUBG? Blue Hole? Yeah. Will, why don't you give me the feedback? I had to listen to Kirk over there. Yeah, I I don't play PUBG. I'm we are working to provide an option to raise the frame rate cap on Xbox One S and Xbox Series S consoles in the future. No timeline. The frame rate boost is welcome for PUBG, which struggles in a performance department on the base consoles. So... I don't know what your confidence level is in that statement. They're like, we're working on it, we hope. But I yeah. think if we get a few more headlines like this, it's going to yeah. hurt the Series S. Hopefully it's just a developer issue and not like a hardware issue, right? I mean, hopefully that's... I don't think anybody wants 30 FPS gaming. I don't think anybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, so hopefully it's a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think you want 30 FPS gaming. No, definitely not. Easy. I want 120. Hey, man. Or maybe 240. Sheesh. Yeah. What are you trying to do? What are you getting in here? I mean, the uh, RTX, what are you getting in here? 3090? Uh, no, the 4090. Oh, yeah. Four, <laughs> what? <laughs> How dare well, you? Eventually it'll come, but... Stop it. Yeah. Uh, Here's a cool one. You know... I'm interested always uh, what Nike's doing. I'm interested what Adidas, I'm interested in what Adidas is doing. I'm interested in what Nike's doing. We had a story on the last episode of this show about Reebok coming into some trouble. Mm. Uh, you know, I wear sneakers here and there. I wear shoes sometimes. Yeah, every so often. Sometimes I kick the feet up and I don't wear shoes, and that's fine too. Uh, Nike did something interesting, which I think has some. Uh, level of importance for brands that are even outside of the apparel business and outside of the shoe business they stopped selling completely on amazon they had a pilot project i believe it was in 2017 they started it and the original purpose of it it was part of a deal they made with amazon to finally police counterfeit products and they said you we, we will make a deal with you we're going to officially sell nike products on amazon but you got to police this thing mm. with the counterfeits. And I guess they thought that was a good deal at the time. But then, you know, fast forward around 2019, something like this, they 
they say, you know what? We're not happy with the way these product pages look. We are a, we're a style. We're a style brand. We want to control the experience start to finish that a person has. You know, you go to Nike website, it's everything mm -hmm. is stylish. Mm -hmm. On Amazon, everybody's an equal playing field. Yeah. You just got a product purchase page. That's all you're looking at. Yeah, and they're all the same. And they're all the same. And so even though Nike was doing really well on Amazon, they wanted to claw back more control over the user experience, over the customer experience, and push people to their website. Now, you know in 2020, and I understand Nike is Nike, but in 2020, people are saying, you can't do that. And I'll tell you from experience, because I did the thing with Later Case, you can do it. I mean, it's a different scale. Obviously, I'm, it's not Nike. But you can do it if you have a strong enough brand or if you have uh, an avenue for promotion like this show mm -hmm. or these shows on YouTube. Well, Nike doesn't need these shows. Nike is Nike. Mm -hmm. Nike's got all the, all the people. They got all the influence. Mm -hmm. What are these guys going to wear? I'm talking about athletes and I'm talking yep. about uh, for, for style. It is, Nike is Nike still. Mm-hmm. And so they felt like, hey, we don't need to be on Amazon. We can control the thing. We can keep the whole margin, and we can get people to our website. Mm -hmm. And Amazon said, Bezos said, good luck with all that. Because mm. he feels like he's got the power position in the thing. But it turns out it worked out for Nike big time, mm. which might surprise you because a lot of other brands, they don't think they can do it without selling on Amazon. They have accelerated their growth. Their direct e-commerce has jumped 30%. And we talked about this on a previous episode that COVID didn't even hit them. So this is after one year? One year. They, 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 they dropped the deal in 2019. Now, funny enough, prior to that, they were at the top of search results for sneakers or for running shoes on Amazon prior to this deal. Nike is not completely off Amazon. I know people are searching right now. They're like, I see sneakers. Those are third-party sellers. Mm -hmm. That's not Nike, Nike. Yeah. And so even now, having been off the site for a while, they're still up there in search results with those third-party sellers, but they dropped down to like 15th place in the search listings. So you're not going to really shop for sneakers. And they actually like that. Mm -hmm. They don't mind a crappy experience on Amazon because they feel like that's what's pushing people to do more business on their website. Mm -hmm. People just say, oh, I can't really, I hate looking for Nike here. And they just go, it happens to me mm -hmm. prior to reading this. It's what I do. If I yeah. want to buy shoes, I'll start on Amazon and then I'll realize, oh yeah, if I want Nike, right. it's not here. I mean, the same thing happens with Adidas to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just go to their website. You know, the shipping takes longer and all the rest of it. They have all the sizes. They do a good job. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they've done well in spite of be not being available on Amazon. And so this may be some kind of an indication to businesses that there, there are other ways to do it. Even though I get it, Nike is Nike. Enormous. They could afford to take a risk like that where smaller brands may be less so. Uh, listen to this. Nike is averaging 100 million visits to its website and is one of the top 10 most downloaded shopping apps. Nike online sales were up 83% in the second quarter, adding $900 million to its total sales. So they are controlling more of the experience, and they're benefiting from it. Hmm. So it's a different approach. All right, last one. Here's a fun one for you, Will. The fast food favorites from the year you were born. Hmm. And, you know, what's funny is I got a kick out of this list. Not necessarily from the year I was born. I do like... The item from the year I was born. Okay. But I just like all the stuff in the 90s because I remember some of it. Yeah. And some of it actually just blows your mind because you can't even, you're like, that thing existed? So anyway, which, what year were you born, by the way? 86. Okay. So I'm 85. Okay. I think I got you beat on the item that came out the year I was born. <laughs> okay. So 85, <laughs> listen to this, uh, 85 was the Dairy Queen Blizzard. Mm. Came out in 1985 which is a classic to this day. That, of course, is soft serve ice cream. Your well, choice of toppings. Yeah, okay. Are you upset that I'm explaining like everyone should well, know this? I don't even like desserts anyway. <laughs> oh, you don't like desserts. Okay, so you feel like you got me beat. Anyway, let me just explain the blizzard. They've reportedly sold more than 100 million blizzards within a year. Wow. Oh, okay. 
So people are into it, whether you're not. You can put Oreos in it. You can put, they put all kinds of different things in it. But apparently Will is uh, too stuck up for dessert, which is uh, kind of upsetting. 1986 was the Taco Bell seafood salad. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds delicious. Can you even imagine it? They did that? A I mean, seafood salad at Taco Bell. Man, that sounds so risky. It was consisting of shrimp, whitefish, snow crab, black olives, and salad leaves. Imagine that from Taco Bell. Well, Mind-boggling okay. stuff. Give you a couple of others here. Uh, 88 was the Pan Pan Pizza at Little Caesars. 89 was when McDonald's tried pizza. Oh. McDonald's tried to sell that pizza. You remember that McDonald's pizza? Mm -hmm. You had the McDonald's Mighty Wings in 90. You had the McLean Deluxe hamburger in 91. You don't even remember that. No. Domino's breadsticks came in 92. 93, how about the McLobster? Oh, yeah. I tried that. No, you didn't. I did, yeah. In 93? Not in 93, no. It was, they brought it back at one they, point. Yeah. Like a couple of years ago. I was going to say, that would be, uh, you said 86? Seven-year-old Willie Do with the McLobster? Having a time? Oh, great time. Imagine that guy. Uh, we had, what do we have? Stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut came in 95. Wendy's chicken, uh, spicy chicken sandwich came in 96. Let me look. Oh, the, the original recipe KFC sandwich was 99. Starbucks Frappuccino came in 2000. So it's a little trip down memory lane. You know, I don't, I don't mind a little fast food update. You know, I don't eat that stuff all the time, Will, but uh, it always brings back those memories, doesn't it? Mm-hmm.